KYW News Radio Original Podcasts. You know, there's a truth to the restaurant industry that um, people don't want to talk about, where it's often a place where someone who has a record is the only place they can get a job. That's Sammy. She's a bartender and does beer sales for Triple Bottom Brewing. I've worked in every kind of shape, size of uh, what the industry can present in Philadelphia. And uh, this is just the happiest and most cared for that I've ever been. Um, and I know that other people who work here feel the exact same way. Triple Bottom doesn't hide who they hire or how they hire. They're proud of it. My name is Courtney Boyd, and I work for a Triple Bottom Room. I work in a snack team. I'm, I'm a formerly incarcerated person. At the beginning of the month, Triple Bottom had 18 full and part-time employees. About a third of the staff was made up of people with backgrounds that might have caused them to be turned away by other employers. I've had a wonderful time here. They had in them something that I wanted to be a part of. I'm Brian Seltzer. Today, how Triple Bottom Brewing uses its business to give people a fair chance. It's the middle of the summer, and Tess Hart is showing me around Triple Bottom Brewing. All right, so we are on the patio in front of Triple Bottom Brewing. We overlook the beautiful Spring Garden Street, and uh, we're going to head inside. My dad painted this door. So this building is now our home on the first floor here at 915 Spring Garden. Um, the building is called the Redding. So it was originally built in 1909. Tess is Triple Bottom CEO. She co-founded the brewery in 2019 with her husband, Bill, and with head brewer, Kyle Carney. We have a Triple Bottom line. That's why we are called Triple Bottom Brewing. We call it Beer People Planet. So that means that we measure our success not just based on our profits, but based on our impact on our community and the environment. The idea for a brewery first came to Tess and Bill in 2014, when they were about to go into grad school. But it would take them a few years before they really got the ball rolling. We had been visiting what was, at least at the time, and I think is still the southernmost brewery in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's called Brewery Austral. It's in southern Chile. We were like, what if we did this? Um, and that was it. We never actually thought we were going to do it. Um, but we wrote it down and started brainstorming all the ways in which we would activate sort of these additional mission elements because that was our background. It just sort of was an idea that kept us up at night for a few years before we even decided to see, like, what if we started a business plan and just saw where it went. Triple Bottom is a 10-barrel craft brewery. That means they can brew about 2,500 pints of beer at a single time. We're going to step into the brew house now, toward the end of a brew day. Kyle, what did you brew? Uh, Tumbling Sun. Oh, Tumbling Sun is my favorite beer. Tumbling Sun is a New Zealand-style pilsner. Um, we just ran out of it on tap. So There's a little bit of everything on the beer menu at Triple Bottom. They've got this very nice handcrafted wooden chalkboard that's got the tap list on it up on the wall. Ambright is a Czech Amber Lager, Good Attitude, a Juicy Pale Ale, Pils Adelphia. You can probably guess what type of beer that is. My favorite, Block Party, a crisp, piney West Coast IPA. Triple Bottom also does one-off brews for special causes like Our Choice, an IPA that benefits the Abortion Liberation Fund, and Volia, a summer lager that raises money for Ukraine. While we were under construction, we started hosting the community organization meetings here just so folks could be in the space and understand that it's for them um, and to help us come up with ideas for how to use it. We host monthly neighborhood cleanups here. Everyone gets a free beer. So it really felt like a place with a really deep and activated community in West Poplar that I think hasn't experienced a lot of investment in the neighborhood. So how did this brewery that kind of began with an idea, a doodle, and a notebook during a backpacking trip in South America end up becoming this unapologetic, mission-driven, fair-chance employer in the middle of West Poplar? A lot of Triple Bottom's identity comes from Tess Hart. She grew up in the Philadelphia suburbs, and she feels like she was given a pretty good shot to succeed in life. Working in 
in the world that I do and with people from so many different experiences, it does make you realize like how much privilege and whatever type of success our society defines is just based on luck. I am lucky because I got to live in a place that was stable and have a great education and that has affected what I can achieve. It puts things into perspective. It puts whatever level of privilege you have into perspective for sure. While she was in grad school and then after she graduated, Tess did a lot of consulting work for nonprofits that wanted to help formerly incarcerated people get jobs. I got to, before starting Triple Bottom, really get to see how a job can change a life in a way that I think is actually pretty universal. I think a lot of us have had a job that has changed our lives, changed how we think about our potential and our future. But to see and to work with folks who have had that experience when for a long time no one would give them a chance is especially powerful. That's been one of the big challenges in terms of people formerly incarcerated coming home is finding a a livable wage that that allows them to prosper. John Pace is the senior reentry coordinator for a nonprofit called Youth Sensing and Reentry Project. We're talking in a conference room in his office on 16th and Walnut, and he's telling me a bit about his past. I I think like most young people, and I oftentimes share my story that, you know, not unlike most young people, I wanted to be a police officer. I wanted to be a football player. But, you know, I I grew up with a single mother raising 11 children. John told me he was sentenced to die in prison when he was 17 for his role in a robbery that went wrong and left a man dead. And then uh, I subsequently learned 10 days later that he passed away and I was charged with homicide. And so this was obviously the most devastating moment of my life that I was responsible for someone's life being taken. Just seeing the look on my mom's face, just the fact that her son was responsible for this was something that was very hurting for me. And just the fact that I knew I was responsible for somebody's life being taken as well. In 2012, the Supreme Court's decision in Miller v. Alabama gave some juvenile lifers the chance at a reduced sentence. John Pace was released in 2016 after serving 31 years at Graterford. I think I was always optimistic. I, 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 I won't lie to say yes, like definitively I, I could imagine it. I often thought about how could, how could I be in a position where I could utilize my experience to be helpful to others. I've always thought about that. Now, John helps YSRP place formerly incarcerated people like himself in jobs at fair chance businesses like Triple Bottom Brewing. This is one of the really unfortunate pieces of it. You go to an interview, you do well at the interview, and a and, and, uh, potential employer really likes you. And the employer says, now I have to do a background check. And they come back and they determine that you have a record. And they say, I really like you, but unfortunately, you, you, your background didn't check out. And so despite the fact that you had an impressive interview, because of that record, you won't get this opportunity. It's like that scarlet letter you have on you because of the simple fact that you have a felony that people don't believe or, or they stigmatize you to thinking that you're not worthy of this opportunity. You know, and some people take the position, why should I give you this job when, you know, these people that didn't commit a crime uh, are, you know, deserving of the same opportunity. As we sit around the conference table in his office talking, John's trying to jog his memory off the top of his head. He says the Youth Sensing and Reentry Project has probably matched four or five formerly incarcerated people with Tess Hart and Triple Bottom Brewing since it opened. You can imagine many of the barriers that many of the individuals have when they come out. So not only, you know, are you just trying to prosper and take care of your family, but also you still come out with potential restitution, court costs and fine. Individuals, if you're still on parole, you have to pay parole once a month. Like, these are still things that you have to take care of. And how can you do those things if you're, 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 not, you're making a wage that doesn't allow you to, to be able to take care of those things? And that's where sometimes individuals struggle with. We pay a living wage. We guarantee that, right? The minimum wage in our industry is $2.83 an hour because it's a tipped minimum wage. I think that's unacceptable. 
completely unacceptable, and that was never on the table for us, but it means that our payroll costs are way higher than the folks that we're competing with. That's tough. That's something that you know, we have to make harder choices over and over again, but we also get to retain this great team who cares about this business with us, and on the whole, it feels like we're building a business that will ultimately stand on its own and not have to extract labor from folks, and that feels like the way we want to move through the world. So I wanted to know, what does this hiring process actually look like? How does Triple Bottom Brewing find people that are going to be a great fit for the brewery? And on the flip side of that, how do these people find Triple Bottom? It starts with partnerships with like-minded organizations, like the Youth Sentencing and Reentry Project, for example. We always have a job description, but before they send people our way, we usually just have a conversation about the type of person who we think would really succeed in that role, and then also the type of supports that we're offering, right? It's a two-way street. What are we as employers going to provide? Remember Courtney Boyd from the start of the story, the member of Triple Bottom Snack Team who was formerly incarcerated? Well, it was through John Pace and YSRP that Tess and Triple Bottom found him. They sent a letter out to us, contacting us, and I guess part of it was because they liked the work that we did as well, and they shared with us about, here we have a potential, uh, a couple of spots that might be available, and we're looking for individuals who were formerly incarcerated. And so we uh, informed two of the client partners that we worked with, and they went for interviews. And these interviews are critical to Triple Bottom's hiring process. We always ask people like to tell us about a time when you had to give someone feedback, something that they might be difficult for them to hear, and why you thought it was important to do and how you did it, right? Because this culture of feedback, even if we're all trying to be understanding of each other, that doesn't mean that we're just going to let each other all slide, right? Like we all have to be learning and growing and making this place work. We want to make sure that people can approach that with empathy. Empathy. Not judging anyone. These are concepts I heard a lot about at Triple Bottom. I asked Courtney Boyd what it's been like for him to work in an environment like this. I can just be myself. I can just be me, you know. And that's the only person that I can be. I don't feel like I'm being judged, I, you know, other than just being, you know, fellow human being. And how important is that? Very important not to be prejudged by people because, you know, uh, we always, I used to always say when I was in prison that um, you're not who your mistake was. You know, you can't let that one mistake define who you are. Triple Bottom is about beer, people, and the planet. But it's a business, too. So if there were a fourth bottom line involved, it's got to be money, right? It's hard. Making payroll sometimes is hard. And uh, that's just the reality of... I think small business in general and specifically in the times that we're living in, you know, we're lucky that we've already met those. We've already been there. That's how we opened was, was with these principles that people and other businesses are now asking for. We're not having to adapt in those ways as much as we, as much as some of our peers. We already have those costs baked in. We've been planning on them the whole time. But there's something else Triple Bottom has to account for when they're hiring formerly incarcerated people working with people who have no work experience. How do we get this done, right? How do we find a goal at the end of the day? How do you run a business with people who've never done it before? That's Nathan Matlin. He's Triple Bottom Brewing's general manager. Nathan's got a lot of experience working with formerly incarcerated people in the hospitality industry. When I moved to Philadelphia in 2011, I started working with Project Home. Um, At the time they were running what's called the Homepage Cafe at the central branch of the Free Library. That was a uh, nonprofit business that was employing people who were formerly incarcerated or in recovery. Um, so I ran that business, and that was really my first kind of exposure to a trauma informed workplace. Trauma informed workplace. That's a phrase I'd never heard before I talked with Tess and the people at Triple Bottom. All of us have traumas, right? Like it's not specific to certain members of our team. And so that's sort of where we begin is this shared acknowledgement that, like, Everyone's had things in their lives that are hard, and they all affect us in ways that we may not even realize. We work on having safety plans for people, so if they do begin to feel overwhelmed, if any of us begin to feel overwhelmed, we've already sort of pre-established like, what steps we take and how we can support that, and, and that's just 
accepted on our side. Like you need to go do your safety plan, go do it, get off the floor and that's fine and come back when you're ready. At first, what Tessa and I always laugh about is people um, are taken aback by kindness, especially in the workplace, right? When people, hey, I'm not feeling well today. Well, then why don't you go home? You know, like take care of yourself. When you put your staff first, that kind of community and space really trickles down to people around you and you can coach people individually on what makes them happy. So almost every conversation I have with staff members here is built towards learning more about them so I can manage them better, right? It's not a Jedi mind trick. It really is just like, I just learned that about you. You learn this better. I'm going to talk to you like that. Where this, what I do here bugs you, I can change that, right? It's not always about me. It's changing. It's about like adapting to that person. John Pace, the senior reentry coordinator for the nonprofit Youth Sentencing and Reentry Project, thinks this is the right approach. Formerly incarcerated individuals probably want to be treated like everyone else, really, because we all are human beings and we all go through these different stresses. Because what stresses you might encounter with a formerly incarcerated person may not be the same stresses that someone who hasn't been incarcerated, but still they might have triggers as well. In no way do we want to ever put someone on an island by themselves, say this person has had these experiences and therefore this is how we must treat them and this is what we expect of them. There's a lot of shame about poor decisions that you made and you don't want to be remembered like, like that because you know that it really, is, it really is not reflective of who you really are. You want to be able to demonstrate that I was better than that. We all treat each other with respect and with curiosity and kindness, and we all hold each other to high standards in terms of how we move through this space. There's only looking at what's happening now and what we can do together moving forward. I'm getting ready to leave Triple Bottom Brewing, and I take a peek behind the bar and look through this open window that leads back into the kitchen, and there's Courtney Boyd back there all by himself on a 100-degree day, prepping a white bean dip that's on the snack menu. He's caramelizing onions in a pan, mixing all the beans together in a blender. He's also getting ready to make some grilled cheese. It smells fantastic back there. Courtney's in the zone, so I don't want to mess with his flow too much or his groove, but a few moments later, I ask him, What he likes most about his job. I like the idea of seeing people's faces when they when they're enjoying the food. You know, I I enjoy that that people appreciate it when they eat the food. You know, sometimes you know you get those compliments back, and they call me a chef. (laughs) I'm not a chef. chef, I just prepared food. (laughs) Of all the things that Tess Hart, Cripple Bottom CEO, and I talk about, one idea sticks with me the most. And it's that we tend to fall into this trap sometimes where when we're talking about someone who's had to overcome an obstacle or adversity, we say they're getting a second chance. But the problem with that is that implies these people were given some kind of chance in the first place. And as Courtney Boyd's story reminds us, that's not always the case. I think this is my first chance, actually, you know, because when I went away, I was a kid defender, so... Now I'm a grown man, you know, so that's the thing that I, I, I understand most. I'm Brian Seltzer. Tom Rickard is the director of KYW News Radio Original Podcasts. Thanks to Sabrina Boyd Circa for helping put this together, and to the teams at Triple Bottom Brewing and the Youth Sentencing and Reentry Project for being so generous with their time. Check back next week for another story about the people and issues shaping Philadelphia.